Can everybody hear me? Great. Yes. We'll be starting in one minute. Counting down. 60, 59. <laughs> So last time I checked, I don't think I, I acknowledge or know anybody of you. So I'm not going to skip the first part kind of introduction myself. Okay. Okay, we'll be starting now. Good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to be here today. The topic of today is an agile approach to threat modeling for 16 Ajax Foundry. In this talk, I'm going to share some knowledges and the lessons we learned during our journey of Ajax Foundry development. So before we start our session officially, please allow me to introduce myself. Of course, my name here, Ting Yu Sung. I'm working based out of Raleigh, North Carolina, or specifically Research Triangle Park, if you are familiar with the area. As a security architect in the IoT platform division of the Dell technology, I have been involved into a couple of open source as well as a commercial product. In the open source project Ajax, I'm one of the major code contributors for the security component and uh, currently a co-chair of the security working group. Before taking the position in Dell, I was a principal engineer in RSA security, where I got involved into a couple of security products, including data loss prevention or threat detection and response. Okay, after wasting about one minute of you guys, so let's go back to the business. This is the today's session agenda. Uh, we will start with the first question, what is AJAX? The answer will be covered in the section one, just like every open source project, the Ajax is facing all kinds of challenges here. So in section two, we are trying to just go over the security challenge we have. To address the challenges, we'd better to invest the tools that work. Threat modeling is one of the kind. So in section three, we are going to cover the threat modeling, like what is threat modeling, what can we do with threat modeling? How can we perform threat modeling? So after section three, we have some ideas about threat modeling. We are going to use Ajax example and trying to apply the background information knowledge we learned from the section three into the Ajax project to address the challenges we have. Okay, this is section one about the Ajax Foundry introduction. So we, have, we, have, we are going to answer the questions like what is Ajax and why we developed Ajax and what are the principles we are trying to follow during our designing and implementation of Ajax and how Ajax works. It is vital important to understand the background information here before we bring the security into the table. Okay, Ajax Foundry, or we call the Ajax most of the time, is open source, vendor neutral project. In Ajax, we are trying to build a framework that provides the interoperability and the compatibility for the edge computing. So it is a platform independent, means it supports both x86 and ARM architecture, and it works on Windows, Linux, or Mac, if you like and it supports a customized plugin module. Those modules could be written with different languages. We support them through the common REST APIs from the framework. So the motivations behind the Ajax framework, in today's IoT world, it is very noticeable that there are so many platforms available. It could be good or it could be bad, depends on your viewpoint. So Ajax is trying to get into the place where we build and promote a common framework unifying edge computing. So it encourages the community to create ecosystem of plug and play. 
So any part of the platform could be replaced, could be upgraded, or it allows the security the service to scale up and down based on the security services capacity and the user cases. And it's very helpful to provide the tools to create Ajax-based IoT as solution quickly. So in the same time, collaborations between the open source projects and the standard group will benefit the industry as well. Okay, so as we see here, that is uh, the high level architecture of the Ajax. In the center of the architecture, we have the core service. So this mark is a gray, the dark area, those are required components that serve the foundation of the system. So it includes core data, command, metadata, registration, and configuration service. On top of the components, we are having replaceable or reference service, such as the scheduling, alert, notification, and the distribution service. So these are loosely separated. And uh, we are trying to define the northbound and the southbound over here. So the northbound here refers to the cloud side mainly, either the public or in-house. The southbound of the Ajax, that is where the devices, the sensors, meters, thermostats rest. System management and the security are the service kind of across the bounds, as we see here on the both sides. And uh, these are considered as a part of the underlying infrastructure. How the Ajax works currently? So Ajax is composed of a dozen of microservices. Mostly are written with Go language, with a very small portion implemented with the script currently. So each microservice is responsible for a single feature of the system, such as a sensor data collection or data persistence, data exporting, system scheduling, et cetera. So the microservice communicate with each other through their REST API interface. That's providing the maximum flexibility over here. The Ajax can be deployed through the Docker or Docker Compose file or Snap distribution which is another container system, if you like. And even the edges can be run over the native system, if you like, just kind of a binary we build out of those source code. Okay, so this is the agenda for the section two. So every project has a challenges, and every project has its reward. In section two, we are going to discuss the challenges in the Ajax project. So focusing on security part, of course this is today's major topic here. So Ajax roots in the IoT field, so it faces a similar challenges as other IoT projects. <coughs> Ajax is open source project as well, so it has similar challenges as other open source projects. So we are in need of a strategy and a trackable approach to respond to the challenges over here. So the power of the IoT device is improving rapidly in the past year. What could be done with a big bulky system in the past can be implemented into a very tiny chip right now. However, compared with the computers or other devices, it still has very limited storage or processing power. And not like the PC or mic, an update of the software could be just a click away here to upgrade an IoT device Sometimes it requires multiple steps or even physical access. Authentication, authorization, and secure communication are big issues in IoT as well. So take an example of the smart thermostats that send the data and receive the commands to change the temperature setting remotely. How could we just know the reading are authentic and the command to change the temperature is not from malicious users? and how we make sure the data reading won't be stolen by some other unauthorized users. Those are questions we have to face and we have to answer. Security challenge exists in the open source project as well. With code base available for all the public, so we wish anybody who is interested can just set up and do the code review 
trying to catch the defects before adopting that. However, unfortunately, this is not the case all the time. And it is challenging to review the code base and identify, identify the security, security issues in the short term without help. So nowadays, it is almost impossible to find a software that doesn't depend on the third party modules. These modules bring potential security risks as well. And uh, like any software development, a switching hands of the developers in the open source project is inevitable, and the design could be changed later as well. The security loopholes could be introduced around the same time. So to address those security challenges mentioned above, we introduced threat modeling into our project. So threat represents a potential danger to something value in the system. The modeling is just a procedure to identify these value resources, recognize a potential tax against the resource, plan and implement some sorts of methods to reduce or remove the dangers. For the contributors of open source project, it provides a guidance on security compliance. For the end user, it helps understanding what and where the potential attacks might happen. Instead of a band-aid style security plugs, it provides a progressive and a predictable approach to enhance the security of the project. So this is the section three we are going to cover. As we mentioned previously, threat modeling provides so many benefits for a project. So the next question that comes out is, how do we do it? In section three, we are going to find out the formal definition of threat modeling and when is the time to do that and who can do that or how can we do that. So here is the definition of a threat model and threat modeling from the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP.org. As we can see here, threat model is a defined as a structured representation of all the information that affects the security of application. The threat modeling here is a process of capturing, organizing, and analyzing all the information. And it enables the decision making about the risks. The output of the threat modeling is a prioritized list of security improvements to the concepts, requirements, designs, or implementations. Basically, it covers the whole scope of the software development. When should we start threat modeling? So just like software development, the best time to start threat modeling is before we write the first line of the code here. It is time to recognize the risks and build solutions into the system, and it's cost efficient to make changes easily. However, it is not realistic for a lot of projects currently. So with agile development widely adopted, it is a good idea to have the threat modeling at the start of each sprint to make sure the proposed new features are not introducing the potential risks. At each milestone release of the project, having threat modeling with product roadmap will display a much clearer picture of the product and gaining us confidence on the security improvement. So in nutshell, performing the threat modeling when the system has a change, if you can. So who can do that? Well, there may be understanding, there might be a misunderstanding here that we have to have a security expert to the threat modeling. This is not true. So think about who is the best person to understand the product or the module in your team. The person could be in your team already. It is not very difficult to perform a threat modeling as long as the proper procedure is followed. So the goal won't be far away and reachable. What if the project includes millions of lines codes and too big to handle? That happens all the time as well. So start from a smaller module applying the threat modeling approach and expanding the coverage so you will reach our goal sooner than you think. Okay, let's go to the steps for the threat modeling here. 
The first step of strand modeling is to understand the system architecture and create a model that reflects the architecture and trying to bring down the smaller piece. So this step can be iterated further until each piece contains a small single feature. It is okay to have some abstracts while hiding the details so that it can be viewed as a whole during the one iteration. Next step, we utilize data flow diagram or whatever data flow diagram you like to expose the interaction between those components. So this is where we draw the trust boundary. With the trust boundary of the component, the communication is considered safe and reliable. Another important factor to be identified in the step here is called asset. So this is something we are trying to protect and attacker might be interested with. Having those information in mind, so we can move to the next step, which is identifying the potential attacks. Okay, probably quite a few people already seen those triangles before that represent confidentiality, integrity, availability, availability or as known as CIA threat. So these are top three fundamental property of security in the threat model. So the confidentiality ensures the information can only be accessed by authorized individuals. Integrity ensures that the information is authentic and reliable. And availability means the resource accessible to meet a business need. In threat modeling, there's one more thing we have to think about. That's called non-repudiation, which means someone cannot deny something he has done. A good example would be digital signature. A lot of people have been using that, uh, which means you can only, your digital signature can only be used by the individual who signed it. Okay, so taking those security factors and think from the opposite direction means how these properties could be violated. Then we have one of the most mature classification tech model here. Right. Stand for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of the privilege. This was promoted by Microsoft about decades ago, and it was widely accepted as one of the practical methods of threat modeling. Because it answers very basic question, when, but very important question, how will my system be attacked by the hackers? Spoofing means an individual could pretend to be someone else other than himself. Tampering means an individual could modify something. And the reputation means an individual could deny what he did. Information disclosure means providing information to an unauthorized individual. The denial of the service means absorbing the source so that the service is available for alleged users. The elevation of the privilege means an individual in a lower privilege group could access the resource that are available for the higher privilege group user only. Once we identify those trust boundaries of the component, the assets of a need to be protect and the strike model, a strike threat, we are moving to the next step. That means we are trying to mapping these threats against the components. Let's imagine a user case that a module reveals the temperature reading over a port and store the data onto the disk. The data will be our asset to be protected. And the trust boundary is identified as a port. So based on the strike attack model we discussed before, is spoofing possible? Yes. Anyone can send data over the interface. Is tampering possible? Yes. The data could be modified before arriving the port. How about a non-reputation? Is possible as well? Because owner of the device could claim, oh, we didn't send out the data reading at all. Information disclosure. Yes, of course. The reading data belonging to one device could be obtained by another unsolved user as well. And how about the denial of service? It is possible because millions of requests can be sent to the port 
to use up all the resource over there. And uh, how about the last one, the elevation of the privilege? Yes, the data could be a construct in a way that is to be used to change the user's group. Here, we are recognizing all the potential tasks for, from multiple viewpoints. And next time, we are trying to just uh, reduce or just remove those threads. For reduce or remove the threads, we call that threat mitigation. So this is a stage of the threat mitigation as we displayed here. And if the threads are exposed during the design stage, which is pretty good, and we have the great chance to update the system design, adding the security enhancement or improvement over here. If they are exposed during the milestone release, which happens as well, it is a good approach to include such information and possible solution in the project roadmap so that the user, developer, understand what we are going to address regarding security next step. So if a solution is not available, or risk is considered very low. So it is not uncommon to accept and document the risk. And uh, the last resort, probably not pretty, just transfer the risk without fixing it. This looks like silly, whatever. However, if you read a lot of the terms, service, or license agreements of the software, you will find out they do not fit. Okay, this is our section four. We already understand what is threat modeling, what is threat model, and what steps. So we are going to just use our project Ajax as an example to see how we are going to apply them. So this is a common practice. We can use that for any project if you like. When we go back to the high level architecture of the Ajax, so we learn from the topmost level, as you can see. So this is a kind of a, they were divided into a different uh, categories and loosely divided as the southbound and northbound over here. On the southbound over here, the sensor data is collected by the device service from the thing. And it is the place where objects interact with outside the world. So, we define a trust boundary over here. The trust boundary is identified on the south side. On the north side, that is, we are, we are connecting with the enterprise or cloud system. So which is another place where interaction with outside world of the edX happens. So this will be another trust boundary we are defining. So in this level, our assets are the REST API endpoints that could be consumed by the external entities, and those are the resource our, we are exposing to outside the world. And those are the resource we are trying to protect in this level. When applying the strike model we mentioned in the previous section on the set over here, we have the attack tables. As we can see here, we have assets we are trying to protect on this level, and we have the threat against them, and we have possible method of such threat. And even we have a severity level associated with this information. Those tables gives us a clear and trackable list about what we are going to start regarding the security improvement of the Ajax. Taking example of the table over here, we have a device REST API, the threat is spoofing, and the method here is the attacker sends the data with fake identification of the IoT. And we think, okay, this is severity is high, which we need to just address or just fix it. And the same device service REST API, and it's facing the threat of information disclosure. One of the possible methods for information disclosure is made the middle attack, and the severity is high as well, and that's what we are gonna protect. By following these steps, you are identifying the assets, you are identifying the threats of possible method severity, and the next step was just uh, try to fix them. Once the threats are recognized, it is time to reduce or remove them. In the architectural level, we decide to adopt 
various technologies from, for the mitigation. So for example, in our project, the REST API endpoints need to be protected. So we utilize API gateway to reduce attacking surface. A metering mechanism can be implemented with the API gateway to prevent a denial of service attack. And we implement the JSON Web Token, JWT, as well as OAuth authentication with the API gateway to mitigate the threats of spoofing. Such steps can be <coughs> performed in the next lower level of the smaller components. So let's go back to this architecture diagram here. We notice the dark side, again, that is the core service, and the service around them are optional. But the data is passed to the core service from the local persistence, and the commands are passed over the core service for device and the meters. So when we draw the trust boundary around the core service, we are identifying a new attacking surface and new assets. So for example, here in this level, we notice some microservices need the credential to access the database. So these credentials become the new assets we are trying to protect. And applying the threat model, and we are learning what kind of attacks may happen and what mitigations we need to adopt. So this approach can be applied repeatedly to the lowest module of the system to maximize the benefit of the threat modeling. With such list of threats and mitigation strategies, the security is no more a hassle, but a manageable and trackable approach. So in conclusion, we feel threat modeling helps the team understanding and evaluate the security threats and the resolu resolutions quickly. And it is a practical approach to expose threats in different stage of development. So threat modeling is adapted in different level of the scope of the open source projects. We encourage every team to try on threat modeling and share the result with the community. At the end of the presentation, this is a list of the reference regarding threat modeling as well as Ajax Foundry. And this include books, technical talks, and links. More details of threat modeling can be found over there. And uh, here we are just open the QA session. Please. Uh, can I just uh, repeat the question a little bit? Yeah, so basically, if a citizen is interacting in the larger world where they interact with other devices that may be on the same device, yep. or that could expose and change the threat modeling, mm -hmm. what kind of practical uh, experience and guidelines uh, do you find helpful for doing that? Okay, so his question is uh, what kind of a guideline we are finding or we feel that's helpful for those uh, connecting between the Ajax and other device, probably northbound device or southbound device, right? So or, that's or sometimes horizontal. Horizontal, yeah, horizontal is another topic as well. So the approach we are trying to get here is we are trying to just uh, reduce the connections of the Ajax here. If you have an open model over there connecting from all around the world, so it's very difficult to detect. So in security, it means that you have an open attacking surface, which is not good at all. So one of the uh, approaches we have here is just trying to reduce the, the attacking surface. And we open very limited port from the, from the Ajax. As you can see, we are opening quite a few REST APIs. That is easier for the northbound side, but the southbound side, you'll see they have different MQTT or zero MQ, all kind of connections. So in the Ajax, what we are doing here is we are trying to have a device service. So the device service is a single point to connect all those things. And if we decide the security trust boundary 
inside Ajax, that is another layer of the security trust boundary we connect, we are trying to define between the device service and the core part. We are trying to protect over there. If you define the trust boundary outside the Ajax, which is uh, outside the device service, so you are facing all kinds of uh, protocols, MQTT, zero MQ, and basically that's a problem, that's part you have to kind of analyze the device and make sure those connections are protected. For MQTT, you have those uh, password credentials, or for others, you probably have applied SSL or TLS. So basically, that's the approach we are doing, yeah. Please. Uh, I have a question regarding the deployment of uh, Ajax. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a probably a bigger topic we are not going to cover here. Lynx Foundation has a project called Edge. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with that part. The Edge is a part of the Edge. The Edge project starts at the beginning of this year, starting from January, to address those unifying the platforms or the kind of what you describe here as a far and edge, those smart device stuff. So Ajax here is serving as the center part of the framework. What you are describing kind of a little bit far, and we have other projects to address that. So think this as kind of our gateway to connecting all the information here. And uh, there's other products trying to just uh, inset, intercept the traffic inside the Ajax. So they are analyzing the data, as you described just now. Those smart things, the traffic, they might be heavy, but on their side, the computing power is really, it's weak. So we cannot rely on them to just kind of detect the attack. So instead, we have to just kind of push a little bit higher on the Ajax side to just uh, detect those malicious behaviors, to detect attacks. So every project has a scope. So for the Ajax Foundry, it's in the center as kind of a gateway part. So on the end side, I would say right now, we are not going to cover that. We can just detect that. We can just tell probably the end user, okay, there are some malicious behavior on your IoT device side, but probably that's it. That's just the scope for the Ajax Foundry currently. Um, I think if you're talking about the data center of the cloud side. Yeah, so the, the, the deployment side to configure from the IoT, how to go from far end to edge, and then try and the PO and go beyond, go to the RDC, go to GCP. So for the Ajax boundary, for this uh, thing, yep. what is the deployment uh, target side? The deployment, the target side is kind of the local. It's not on the north side. So what you are describing, the GCC part, as I described back to the scope here, on the north side, so we have an interface. It's called export service. Those are the place you're connecting with your cloud, with your maybe in-house data warehouse. And for this part, Dell has a hardware, Dell gateway. So this one suits over there. Of course, you, you can install this on different uh, gateway system. Not necessarily Dell, or probably from Cisco for others. So this is not as powerful as the cloud side, but it's not as weak as to the far end of the edge. So it's set in the middle. So think that, like described just now, think that as a gateway or hub. So this is uh, the kind of a deployment uh, scope. I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, sure, no problem. Yeah. Okay. As an example where it turns out we are not horizontally, uh, mm. but we're not going to replace email if it isn't got to comply with the any kind of signal. So it's not compliant with the interactive engine. Okay. A function, for example, uh, let's say uh, demand response mm -hmm. is an example where infrastructure today, it is like this. They want to move to a framework uh, more security oriented. Okay, I think uh, there's a one deployment scope, which is uh, you are describing here for the Ajax, means you're probably running multiple Ajax box horizontally, and they are connecting with each other, and they are changing data, things like that, right? So I think this is uh, something we are going to address during the, our next release. So we have the Ajax 1.0 release, uh, June of 2019 for the next uh, roadmap. I think it's in coming October. Probably we can find more information over there. So the roadmap and the architecture and that's open to public. We are on the, let me just go back here. The last part that is a weekly page so we can find there and we have the working group meeting um, weekly so anybody is open to join. So I think the questions you have here could be answered there as well. Sure. Okay. No more questions? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>